Welcome to uh, week 9 lectures. Um, we are going to um, learn in this week data link layer. Um, this is in chapter 6, uh, section 6.1 to 6.4 actually, but today we'll try to cover 6.1 to 6.3 and tomorrow we can cover 6.4. Our goals is to understand the principles behind link layer services, the error detection, correction, how do you share a broadcast channel, uh, multiple access, uh, the, how do you address, uh, and uh, what's the local area networks. So as you can see, some of the sections are not um, included. So for example, virtual LANs will be excluded. Um, link virtualization 6.5 and 6.6 .6 are excluded as well. So we are going to uh, cover error detection, uh, multiple access, uh, switched lens, and uh, we'll end it up with uh, some notes uh, in 6.7. So let's have a look at the introduction, what sort of services we get out of link layer. So, so far what we have looked at is the macro scale. So we looked at the internet uh, from the top down. Uh, you can see in this picture uh, there are ISPs and then the customer um, uh, networks. And this is another uh, network and how they are connected with each other. Uh, today, if you want to understand link layer, then we have to go from macro to micro. So at the micro layer, you can see this is a subnet. Here, this is uh, there is no router. So these machines here you see are switches, layer two switches. So these are the link layer devices. And this router is the network layer device that connects this whole subnet to the other subnet or to the internet. So what we are going to look at today is how in this subnet, the hosts are connected to each other. In terms of terminology, basically we are going to use three different terminologies. The nodes are the hosts and the routers. The links are the connections between two hosts. They can be wired, um, such as fiber optic. They can be wireless, electromagnetic, RF. Uh, they can be point-to-point uh, -point or local area networks. Then we have frames, um, so the layer 2 packet, uh, which is called frame, and how we are going to see how the framing is used to transport uh, IP datagrams between two machines within a subnet. So basically, data link layer has the responsibility of transferring IP datagrams from one node to another node, which are both physically ad ad adjacent. So in this example, you can see these two nodes are physically adjacent and they are connected via wireless through this uh, base station. So here you can see these two nodes are um, again in the same subnet. So link layer is between uh, communication between nodes which are physically connected together using the same medium. So it's interesting that um, the different link layer might use different technologies such as you can have Ethernet, you can have frame relay. Don't worry about uh, exactly what frame relay is, but uh, this is more like a wide area network uh, technology. And then we have 802.11 uh, Wi-Fi. And these protocols are different. Some uh, have uh, reliable data transfer. The others may or may not have reliable data transfer and things like that. Okay, so the services you get is you get framing service and today we are going to see what framing service is and then we are also going to get link access service, medium access control. Then you get reliable uh, delivery service. If you remember from chapter 3, we learned about reliable delivery, but here we will uh, focus more on the bit error reliability. Um, these wireless links, they can have very high error rates um, and that's why you need um, the error reliability both at the link level 
um, and at the end-to-end -end reliability. So in chapter three, we looked at end-to-end -end reliability in the context of transport protocols. Uh, but here we are looking at reliability at the link level because if there are a lot of errors, it's better to correct them at the link level rather than let it go all the way to the transport layer and then retransmit the whole packet, which may be waste of uh, networking resources. And you can have other uh, services such as error, uh, error correction as well as error detection, half duplex, full duplex. Um, but uh, we'll mainly today uh, focus on error detection and error correction. So the question is, where do you actually install link layer um, protocol? Um, is it in the operating system? Uh, is it in the hardware? So here you see uh, the picture um, and uh, you can see a machine, we have CPU, we have memory, and then we have the network interface card here. So data link layer is stored in this network interface card or the network adapter, which has a physical layer as well as the data link layer. So this card implements two layers, link layer and the physical layer. And in the operating system, uh, you implement uh, the network layer, transport layer. And in the user space, you implement application layer, um, application uh, software such as um, email and things like that. So here we see that um, two machines are connected by a link and the framing service is used uh, so that datagrams, these are IP datagrams, they are encapsulated in the frame and the frames are transmitted to the next uh, or the destination network interface card or network adapter. And the network adapter um, uh, looks for errors and if there's no error, then it takes the datagram from the payload of the frame and passes it on to the higher layer processes. So why we need framing, what is it? So at the physical layer, everything is in bits, right? So it's all ones and zeros that you are sending and uh, you need to uh, put a meaning of these bits and you have to have the start of the bits and the end of the group of bits. So the framing helps you do that. And on top of that, it also helps, uh, helps you checking any problems or any errors in the bits. So um, we have a preamble at the, at the beginning of the frame, um, and it is basically 10101010. So it's just switching, and uh, this helps to synchronize the clocks. So the, the clocks, uh, if a sender is using its own clock and the receiver is using its own clock, then these two clocks are not synchronized. So how can you synchronize them? So if you're sending uh, alternative one zero and one zero, then a Manchester coding like this, uh, they can help you uh, synchronize them because you can see in the Manchester coding, for one, you have from low to high transition in the middle of the bit, for zero, you have high to low transition in the middle of the bit. So if you are sending one zero one zero one zero, then you should expect uh, the reverse transitions in the middle of the uh, two clock cycles, right? So that will help you synchronize your clocks because it's easier to detect the transitions in the voltage level that you are receiving um, than the actual value of the voltage. So, um, this, this helps to synchronize in the beginning and at the end you have to say this is the um, after after they are synchronized you have to give it a little bit just one byte time to um, prepare it for receiving uh, the beginning of the frame so there is a start of the frame it's just one byte and it is just one zero one zero just like the preamble except we have one at the end so if you look at the frame format for Ethernet, then you will see seven bytes preamble in the beginning, then one byte of start of the frame, and 
the destination and the source addresses of the network interface card and these are six bytes long and then the length of the frame and the payload so the minimum is 46 bytes and the maximum is 1500 bytes now you might recall that we had fragmentation IP so if IP is transmitted over Ethernet the entire IP packet has to fit inside this payload and the maximum payload is 1500 bytes it means the IP datagram has to be less than or equal to 1500 and if it's more than that then it has to be fragmented we have four bytes um, here to uh, do some error uh, checking and correction on the frame data and then this is the interesting thing interframe gap it means that you cannot send two frames back to back there has to be some time between two frames and this time is actually uh, measured in bytes so it's 12 bytes or 96 bits but how long in time domain this 96 bits should be so if you're using 100 megabit per second ethernet then it will be 0 0.96 microsecond or if you like it's 960 nanosecond and if you are using gigabits per second ethernet then that will be just uh, 96 mi nanosecond or 0 0.096 microsecond okay now we are going to look at error detection and correction at the link layer so if you have a bit error prone link then bits can be in error uh, bits can be flipped uh, when you receive the packet so it's not packet loss you, you are still receiving the packet but some of the bits have flipped so how do we can how can we detect how the receiving data link layer can detect that the, the bits are have been flipped in the transmission and is it possible to correct them so what you see here is the uh, data is in this uh, payload and we can have a header which is the uh, error detection and correction header so it has some bits and these are the redundant bits on top of the data bits that you were sending and the job of this EDC field or the bits in the EDC field is to detect errors or even correct errors in the data bits so basically what you need is uh, to design uh, this uh, error detection field I mean how do you design the error code uh, so that you can detect as many errors with few check bits and modest computation so you want to detect as many errors as possible and you want to use as few as possible the check bits because you don't want redundant bits because more bits you are transmitting the, the more overhead you have and also the computation how do you compute at the sender to create these bits and how do you compute at the destination to detect that there are errors so to appreciate that what we are saying here let's have a um, very simple example uh, so in this simple example uh, the error code is a very simple code what it says is that okay you have a three bit message and the code is just repeat uh, this message just send this message twice so if the message is 101 it's a three bit message then you have to use another three bit uh, error code which is basically sending the same message again 101 so red is the original message and the black 101 is your um, if you like your uh, error coding bits um, and the way you can detect error is at the receiver if these two messages are not exactly the same for example um, the red is 101 but the black is 100 then you can say okay there is an error so let's see how many errors we can co uh, correct what type of errors we can correct or detect and what is the overhead um, of this um, error correcting code so how many errors can it correct so you can see that the, 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 there is, is, is zero because we, we cannot correct anything we can detect but we have no way of knowing which bit is in error 
The second question is how many errors can it detect? Now you will see that it can detect only the single bit errors. So there are three single bit errors possible. The first bit might be, might be in error, the second bit might be in error, and the third bit might be in error. Or here you have in the, um, uh, the second version of the message, you can have the first bit in error, the second bit in error, the third bit in error. So um, you can uh, you you can detect at most uh, three errors. These are the three single bit errors. You will see that you cannot connect. You cannot detect all the two bit errors. For example, if um, if there are two bit errors, like if this bit is in error and this bit is in error. So there are two bit errors in this transmission, then you will see that uh, you cannot detect them. Um, so um, you, you can see uh, so, some of the bits, uh, bit errors will go undetected. So the question is, what is the overhead? So is this, um, I mean, how much overhead we have? So you can see that uh, we, we double the transmission. So the overhead is 50%. That is, you send six bits here, but the three bits are overhead. So this is 50% overhead. Half of the data, half of the total bits you are transmitting contains error check bits. So this example gives you an idea that if you use a very simple way of detecting errors, then you may not be detecting a lot of errors. And at the same time, you may be incurring a lot of overhead. So obviously, it's important to study the efficient algorithms for error detection and correction. So um, one such algorithm is called parity. Um, so in this example, we are looking at event parity. So let's say you have a message, 21 bits here, 00101101 and things like that. And you want to design a parity um, error code. How does it work? So here, every D bits, in this case, let's say seven, we add a parity bit. So what is a parity bit? So we are going to add one if the number of ones is odd. So it makes it even. And if the number of ones is, is uh, if the number of ones is even, then we add a zero. So uh, so at the end again it's even. So we, what we are trying to do is by adding this extra parity bit, we make sure that the number of ones in the data bits plus in this parity bit becomes even. So that's why it's called even parity. So this. 21 bits can be chopped into three massive chunks of seven bits each. Here you can see, and the parity bit for the first seven bits, because there are three ones, which is odd number, you have to add a parity bit of one. So it makes four ones, so it's even. Here we already have even, four ones, so you add a zero. And for the third one, one. So you can see these are the parity bits you are going to add. So when you send the message, so you send the first seven bits, then you add the parity bit one, then the next seven message bits, data bits, then you add the parity zero, then the last seven, and the, you add the parity one here. So if you send something like this at the other end, it is not difficult uh, to uh, recompute the parity and detect the errors. So let's go and have a look at what's happening at the destination. So at the destination, you just check for even parity. And uh, if uh, odd number, so you, you can see then uh, if an odd number of bits get flipped, then we will detect it. So you can see the detection power is significant here, right? Uh, we can detect uh, any odd number of bits. So if you have seven bits, uh, then you can detect uh, if one bit is in error, if three bits in error, if five bits in an error, right? Because we are using an even parity. And I want you to go back and um, convince yourself that this is true. And what is the cost? What is the overhead of um, even parity bit? 
So you can see one extra bit for every D bit, right? So this is the cost, and depending on the size of D. So in this example, uh, the size of D was 7. So for 21 bits, uh, we uh, at the end, we have transmitted 24 bits. Now what you are going to see is slightly a different version of parity. This is called two-dimensional parity. So in this example, you can see it's the same message and it's the same parity bit. For every seven bit, you have these parity bits. But what we are adding at the bottom here is another eight bits. This is the column wise. So you look at this column of three bits and you add a zero because there is a even number of ones here one one even number of one so it's zero here one one two even so one here is odd so you add a one so you can see these are also your parity bits so there are seven parity bits here but column wise parity and also this is column wise parity so this parity is on top of these parity bits so there are two ones here so that's why we have a zero so now what we are sending we are sending these these parity bits and these parity bits. So what's the benefit of having a two-dimensional parity? So the benefit is that now we can correct. So before we were detecting with a single dimension uh, parity, but now we are able to correct uh, single bit errors. How can we correct? So here is an example. So this is the parity byte, remember? We had to send a parity byte, and these are the parity bits. And this block here is your message block, right? Now, at the receiver, if you are receiving these bits, including the message and the parity bits, can you tell which bit is in error? So you can correct it, because if you can identify so there is a single bit error, and if you can identify which single bit is in error, then you can correct it. Okay? So think about it. Which one is it? Okay, I'll give you the answer. So this bit is in error. So why, why we are saying this bit is in error? Because if this bit is in error, then it means that this parity is wrong. So see there are one, two, three. In this second column, there are three ones. So this parity bit should have been one because we are using even parity. So this is definitely uh, so 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 this row, so this parity bit is definitely row. So there is a problem in this row in column two. And you'll see that this parity is wrong because this is a column parity, and in this column you have one and one, there are two ones, so it should have been zero. So this parity is wrong, and this parity is wrong. So if you take the intersection, then this bit is wrong. But all the other parities are correct, so you need to check yourself and see. Okay, so in practice what happens is that the bits are not always random errors but they are burst errors this happens because uh, in wireless communications for example if there is an interference for example if someone turns on microwave for a couple of seconds then it can destroy a large number of bits back to back in in a burst so this is a significant um, uh, er error and using parities it is very difficult to detect a, a burst error of many bits together um, so um, so what can we do um, so the idea is that uh, we don't worry about the computation cost because at the receiver um, you uh, data link layer is implemented in hardware remember in in our earlier slides we have seen that it is implemented in the network adapter or the network interface card so hardware can process uh, significant uh, computations very efficiently so if we can design um, codes which are uh, computationally intensive but can detect burst errors then maybe we can choose those for data link layer
So let's have a look. So checksum is something that you should be familiar with, right? Um, in the earlier chapters, we have seen that uh, the internet uh, protocols, uh, IP and TCP and UDP, they use checksum. So if you remember, checksum is just summing up the data uh, in parallel, uh, n-bit words, and internet checksum uses 16-bit words. And you'll see that if you use this 16-bit uh, checksum, then you can detect burst errors up to 16. So even if all of the 16 bits uh, are in error in one 16-bit word, then you can detect it. So you can see the power of checksum. Uh, and ch checksum requires sum summing up lots of n-bit words. But if you do it uh, in hardware, then you can do it um, much more efficiently um, by using um, significant hardware uh, capability. So what we, just to summarize, what we have um, learned is that um, definitely we need to have some error detection and correction uh, for the data link layer because uh, the bits can be in error. Um, but uh, definitely we need to design uh, efficient uh, algorithms uh, for uh, error detection and correction so we can detect as many errors as possible with as little overhead as possible and as little computation as possible. Now we want to look at another um, error correct error detecting uh, code called CRC, cyclic redundancy check, which is very popular uh, in the internet. So the way it works is that if you have D data bits, then we want to add R CRC bits. Okay. And with um, R C R C bits, then uh, the mathematical formula for cal cal um, adding R bits is basically you, you are um, shifting, uh, once you append R C R C bits, this whole uh, integer uh, becomes uh, D shifted by R bits, so D to the power 2 to power R, and you are just appending R bits, so this is just XOR function, if you like. Uh, to this number. So um, uh, the key thing here is that this is considered as a number, as an integer, uh, rather than just bits. And uh, you will see that what we need is a generator called G, which is R plus 1 uh, bit long. So this is a pattern, um, a, a polynomial uh, which, uh, which which can be used to generate these R bits. And there are some known uh, polynomials, uh, that, the pattern, G patterns, that are used to create uh, these R bits. And this is very popular. This is used in Wi-Fi. This is also used in Ethernet. So at the sender side, uh, basically what you have to do, you divide uh, these uh, d plus r bits, um, that, that large integer uh, by g, and whatever remainder you have, that the note, note that the remainder will be one bit less than the bits that g has. You, you, that, that remainder will be uh, placed as r, so uh, and then uh, you, you will send that r, and at the receiving end, if you divide d plus r, and you are expecting zero. So the idea here is that if um, the D database is uh, shifted by R bit, so um, the, the, um, th and then you are dividing by uh, G, then whatever remainder you have, if you take the remainder off, the next time you divide, then it will be zero remainder. And uh, later we'll see that uh, taking the remainder off, that is a subtraction, is the same as addition uh, in modulo 2 arithmetic. Okay, so to understand the procedure, we have to look at uh, a practical example. So here we have a very simple example of uh, data bits 1, 0, 
the one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six bit data bits, right? So we shifted by three bits here because our CRCR is three bits. And we divide this number with this uh, polynomial 1001. Okay, so this is a known polynomial. And we are dividing with this polynomial and we are expecting that the remainder will be less than four bits. And that remainder will be R. Uh, so, um, if you divide, then you will see um, then, so this is a modulo 2 division, this is going once, and then uh, you do XR, and this is what you get, and this is your quotient. The next time you do, then the quotient increases like that, and at the end, you finish this division, and then you have 0, 1, 1 as your remainder. So this 0, 1, 1, this remainder is the CRC bit. So this is what you are going to append in the CRC field of your Ethernet header. So all calculations are done in modulo 2 arithmetic. So what is modulo 2 arithmetic? I want you to go and check it up. Uh, it's also in your textbook. So basically, uh, there are no carries or borrows in the subtraction, and the subtraction is the same as the addition, and this is the XOR function. So if you do the XOR, then whatever you get, then if you do the subtraction or plus, you should get the same thing. So basically, in modulo 2 arithmetic, we are going to use XOR for uh, subtraction and addition. Now, if you want to multiply uh, by uh, by 2 to power k basically you are shifting by two bits k bits so here k is 2 so if you want to multiply this 1011 by 2 to power 2 then basically you are shifting left with two zeros and then you will see that this is multiplied by power of 2 so this is the modulo 2 arithmetic Okay, so we have covered uh, now uh, parity, we have covered checksum, we have covered uh, CRC, and CRC is the, 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 the one that is currently used in Ethernet um, and also Wi-Fi. So let's have a quick quiz. So the quiz asks you whether you can correct. So the question here is about correction. Can you do correction? with internet checksums with two-dimensional parity with cyclic redundancy check so what is your answer so the first first column here is about internet checksum second column is about two-dimensional parity and the third one is cyclic redundancy check so what do you think well the correct answer is c uh, because we know that uh, with internet checksums, although we can detect burst errors, uh, a lot of burst errors, we cannot detect any errors. But with the two-dimensional parity, we can detect uh, single-bit errors. So yes, we can detect errors. But with cyclic redundancy, again, we can uh, detect a lot of burst errors, but we cannot uh, correct any. So the answer is no. Okay, so that um, ends our um, discussions about the error correction and error detection algorithms. Uh, the next uh, topic would be um, medium access control, i.e. how um, a medium uh, can be accessed uh, by many different um, uh, devices who are connected to the same uh, medium, the same wire, or same wireless medium. Now let's study multiple access protocols, i.e. Um, how um, a link can be shared by uh, multiple stations at the same time. So if you look at the uh, links, the physical links, uh, then there are basically two types of links, point to point, um, when uh, to, for example, uh, from the Ethernet switch, you connect your um, device to the switch with a wire. It's a point-to-point -point because basically there's um, two devices at both ends of the wire. 
uh, then there's not much to do because it's not shared by a lot of devices and the two devices at the endpoints can just take turns for example a half duplex communication for example but it's the second category uh, that is of concern uh, this is the broadcast uh, when uh, the same um, medium is shared by uh, many devices so for example if you look at uh, here uh, let's change the uh, cursor to better okay so here now you can see this is an old-fashioned um, Ethernet uh, network. Um, a cable is uh, shared by many devices. They are just connected on this bus. So in this case, the signals uh, transmitted by different devices can collide with each other on this cable. Similarly, in the wireless, this is the wireless router, and it has a channel, and all of these devices are using the same frequency channel. So if two devices transmit at the same time, and they are transmitting to the access point, then the access point, at access point, uh, these transmissions will collide. Uh, similarly, for satellite communications, it's like a, a, it's a lot of people having a party and they are all talking at the same time. They are using the air, the acoustic channel, and, and they, they, they can collide. So this is the problem. So how uh, the different devices can coordinate so we can get error-free communication without interference. So that's where the multiple access protocols come in. Um, so the, the way it is done in computer networking is you, you let two or more uh, simultaneous transmissions to happen. You don't try to prevent it uh, exactly. But if it happens, then the collisions can happen, but uh, you, you, need, you need to find a way to recover. So you let the collisions happen and then you recover uh, from the collision. This is how it works. And um, the multiple access protocols are usually distributed algorithms. Uh, so the different, different devices can make their own decisions. Um, and this is this is this is uh, where it becomes very challenging because um, th this is in band communication. There is no out of band channel. Uh, what we mean is that um, you have to use the same channel uh, to coordinate um, for using uh, the same channel. So uh, this this problem is is very challenging. So what are the requirements of um, ideal and ideal multiple access protocol? So there's basically four uh, items in our wish list. So the first one is uh, if you have a channel R bits per second, then you, we should get R bits per second uh, when there is only one node uh, which is transmitting. If there are M nodes transmitting, then they should be able to divide, uh, sh have a share of R over M, and hopefully uh, equal share, uh, so there is a fairness. And it has to be fully decentralized, so this is very important. We don't want any centralized controller, um, so it's simple, and uh, every, every node can make their own decisions. And we don't and, uh, want, want them to be synchronized. Uh, we want decent, decentralized and we don't asynchronous uh, so that there is no uh, clock synchronization needed uh, between the devices, which can be difficult because synchronization has overhead uh, between devices. And the fourth one is simple. We don't want a very complex uh, protocol which requires a lot of computations and which is difficult to analyze. So if you look at the MAC protocols, basically you can divide them into three different categories. The first one is channel partitioning, and we are going to see a bit more about that, where you partition the channel into uh, smaller portions of pieces. Uh, so this partition can be in the time domain, it can be in the frequency domain, and then you allocate these pieces to different uh, nodes uh, uh, so that um, they, they, they have exclusive use of that piece. And that's why, why this is how you can prevent 
collision from other uh, transmissions. The random access, you don't allocate such pieces, um, but, but you, you try to achieve better utilization, so you let them um, randomly access the channel, but then there can be collisions and you have to have uh, mechanisms to uh, recover uh, from these collisions. And the last one is taking turns. It's kind of, uh, you know, you send first and then when you finish, then uh, the next one in the line um, takes over. And when he finishes, the third one takes over. And if someone has uh, uh, more data to send, then he can hold the line for longer. Uh, so these are the three main categories. So let's have a first. Uh, first, let's have a look at uh, channel partitioning and see how the time and the frequency domain pieces uh, can be organized and what are the benefits and what are the disadvantages. So the first up uh, for channel partitioning is TDMA, time division multiple access. Here we are using the time domain to divide uh, the resources of the channel into smaller pieces. So here we have an example of um, a, a six pieces, six slots. So every round we divide the time into six slot time. Okay, so six stations. Let's say there are six stations uh, that, that can maximum can be accommodated uh, in this link. So the first time slot, it's a fixed time slot, is exclusively allocated for the first one. The second slot is for the second station, the third one for the third, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the benefit is that um, that at, at a particular uh, time, it is always uh, your slot to transmit. So the, the, here you can see the, the first slot is here, and then after round one, again, the first slot is at the beginning. So this is a guaranteed uh, piece of resource that you have, every station has. The problem here is that if uh, some of the stations don't have anything to send at some times, for example, in round one, station two has nothing to send and station five and six have nothing to send. So in round one, these slots are wasted because the, the other um, devices cannot use these slots because uh, your data is linked to your slot time. And if you use someone else's slot, then it will be misinterpreted, misinterpreted, right? So now we look at the frequency domain and we at the same time everybody can send. So you have one to six stations, they all can send at the same time, but they use different frequency bands. So you have this blue band, red band, uh, green band, and these are different frequencies. You can see this is a high frequency, this is low frequency, for example. And the benefit is that they can all transmit at the same time. Uh, but uh, and they have guaranteed communication resources but the problem again is same similar to TDMA so in this example you can see if two five and six have nothing to transmit then their frequency resources are not utilized no one else can send f uh, at their frequencies because those frequency pieces bands were allocated to those specific stations. So channel partitioning you can see is, is good to provide some guaranteed uh, resources but if the resources are not used then um, the resources are wasted. So to better understand the channel partitioning let's try to solve this quiz. So um, the quiz is saying, does channel partitioning satisfy um, the ideal uh, properties? So we have four uh, ideal properties, remember? And we want to see um, how many of these ideal properties are fulfilled uh, by channel partitioning. The, the answers are none of them, zero, one of them, right, the first one. Uh, or C is saying only the second property is fulfilled, D is saying only the third property is fulfilled, E is saying the fourth, um, fourth property is fulfilled. So l l let's have a look um, one by one. Um, so how about the property one? If only one node wants to transmit, it can send at rate R. 
Now, is this true? Let's go back and have a look. Okay, so here you can see that if only one node transmits, then still it cannot get all of the uh, bandwidth because the bandwidth is allocated in six portions. So it would only get one over six in this case. It means that the first one is not correct. The second one is when M nodes want to transmit, do they get R over M? Again, it depends on how R is allocated. If R is allocated in N different uh, portions and N is greater than M, then this is not true. Is it fully decentralized three? Um, and, and no synchronization of clocks. This is not true. Uh, for example, if you go back here in TDMA, so then you can see the slots are synchronized, right? Because device one can only transmit here, and then it has to stop right here. So its clock has to be synchronized with the clocks of all the other devices. And again, it can only start transmitting at this time when this slot is repeated. How about four? Yeah, it is simple. Uh, it is really simple because once you allocate it into frequency bands or time slots, then the devices just need to uh, maintain their frequencies or slots to transmit. Okay, um, so. Uh, I think uh, we now have a good understanding of um, uh, the medium and the class, uh, the, the different classes of uh, or uh, the different types of medium access control uh, protocols. Uh, we have also looked into details of channel partitioning schemes, TDMA and uh, FDMA. Um, our next um, goal would be to continue. Uh, with um, uh, continuing with medium access control, but look at uh, some more interesting ones, especially the random access ones, because uh, at the end you will see that the existing internet, um, the, the wireless and the Ethernet, uh, the data link layer, uh, mostly uses uh, random access protocols for computer networking. Now we are going to look at random access protocols. So this is also medium access control protocol, but the access is random. So how does it work? So let's say that the channel data rate is R, and whenever a node has packet to send, it is going to send at the full speed of R. And there is no a priori coordination needed among the nodes. So if you are a node, if you are a network interface card, and if you have a frame to send, you just go and send it. Uh, you don't have to coordinate with any other uh, nodes on the channel, whether they are sending or who is going to send first and things like that. So it's extremely simple. It's just random access. So what's going to happen? Okay, you guessed it right. So if two or more transmitting nodes are sending at the same time because they are not coordinating, then they will collide. And if there is a collision, uh, then um, you have to, um, you know, you, you waste that opportunity to send. And later it will be uh, recovered through retransmissions. Um, but yes, collisions are going to happen with random access protocols. So random access uh, medium, uh, random access medium access control protocols. Um, they specifies how to detect collisions because if you want to recover, the first thing you have to do is you have to detect collisions, and then you have to find a way to recover from collisions. And there are mechanisms such as delayed retransmissions or retransmissions through some probabilities and things like that. So the examples are Aloha. Um, slotted Aloha and the pure Aloha and carrier sense multiple access CSMA and its variations such as CD and CA that are used in various networks such as Ethernet and uh, Wi-Fi. So Aloha is interesting you know in Hawaii uh, Aloha means hello and uh, there are so many islands in Aloha and Norm Abramson uh, you know he, he quit Stanford and he went to uh, Hawaii 
and he found wow uh, these islands uh, they need to be connected so, through some communication networks and uh, then he discovered uh, you know there are uh, ways to uh, communicate the simple simple ways to communicate and then he um, proposed this aloha uh, protocol so what are the assumptions uh, so we are going to start with uh, the slotted version of aloha uh, medium access random medium access control protocol the slotted means that the time is slotted and we assume that uh, all the frames have the same size and they fit into one slot and time to transmit a frame is let's say i okay so that's the time it takes to transmit a frame so the assumption is that the nodes can start transmitting only at the beginning of the slot you are not allowed to start transmitting in the middle of the slot and we also assume that all the nodes are synchronized so they know exactly when a slot starts and of course if two or more nodes transmit in the same slot then all nodes will collide and all nodes will be able to detect the collision so collision detection is assumed uh, which will be used uh, to recover from the collisions so how do they operate so when a node has a frame it transmits in the next slot remember you are not allowed to transmit immediately but only at the beginning of the slot so you have to wait for the next slot then you transmit and then you wait for um, the outcome of your transmission you are um, able to detect collision so if you detect collision then you can retransmit the frame in the next slot but um, now, if, if there is no collision, then you can transmit in the next slot. But if there is a collision, then you are allowed to transmit in the next slot with probability P. Okay, so let's see how, how does this work. So in this example, we have three nodes. Node 1, node 2, node 3. And these are the slots. Okay, so these are the slots. C stands for... Um, collision E stands for empty see the slot is empty C is collision when two nodes transmit on the same slot they collide S is success so here two is successful so let's start from the beginning so all three nodes let's say they start transmitting on the same slot and they all collide so node one doesn't so the probability so this is rolling a dice right so, so with probability p you send in the next slot and with probability one minus p you do not send so let's say node one the, the random uh, uh, the, the randomness says that the node one will not transmit uh, in the second one node two will not transmit node three will not transmit so the second slot is empty in the third slot let's say the node one transmits and node two transmits so again this is a collision and in this slot only node two transmits so this is a success from node, for node two and this is empty here two are sending this is empty and here success for one and here success for node three so what you see is that um, if there is a um, so the positives here is that if there is a single node only in the channel then it can continuously transmit at full rate because there is no collision the other benefit is that's highly decentralized no nodes uh, you know need to communicate with other nodes to coordinate their transmissions they can just transmit on their own right the only thing is that the the, the slots needs to be synchronized and it is extremely simple so what are the cons? The cons are the collisions, right? So when there is a collision, then you are wasting that slot because no one get anything done in that slot. And then there are idle slots. So this is idle. This is idle because uh, you are transmitting with a probability and uh, it's, it's a random. So if, if all of the nodes at that slot decides not to transmit because of the random number generation, then that slot will be idle the other thing is the collision detection here we assume that you will transmit the whole uh, packet 
node 2 will transmit the whole packet and the node 1 will transmit the whole packet and only at the end of the slot you, you detect the collision. But in reality, the, the collisions could have been detected much earlier, right? The collision detection doesn't take transmission of the whole packet, for example, and it means that the collision detection is taking a lot of time here. And the other con is the clock synchronization, uh, because it means that there has to be some synchronization protocol running uh, between the nodes so that uh, all their clocks are synchronized. How about how efficient is slotted Aloha? You will, it's very interesting that you will see that if, um, if all the nodes have always packets to transmit, then the efficiency is 37%, right? So the, 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 uh, the channel would be utilized only 37% of the time, right? The rest of the time, uh, like 63% of the time, the, the, the channel would be underutilized. So this is, um, this is very, very interesting. And you can derive that uh, through these probabilities. And if you take the... Um, you know, optimize this one. We are not going to do these optimizations here, uh, but it is 1 over E, and um, this is 0 0.37, which is 37%. So this is very, very interesting result. It shows you that, yes, it is very simple, but the random access uh, protocols is difficult to uh, have um, good utilization of the channel. Okay, however, pure aloha, right? So we don't do um, slot because slot means that the slots can be empty and you have to wait until the next slot time before you can transmit. So perhaps if we uh, if we use unslotted, like you can transmit whenever you want, um, may maybe we can improve? I don't know. Let's see. Okay, so this is simpler. No synchronization is needed because there are no slots. So when frame arrives, you transmit immediately. You don't have to wait for the slot start time. So of course, the collision probability increases because here you can see uh, that the frames can actually overlap because here the frame can start uh, in here and another frame can start in the middle of another frame going on. So the frames can actually overlap because we do not have the concept of slot. And later we are going to see that this increases the probability of collision. So if you if you want to find out the uh, the probability that the channel will be uh, utilized, then you will see that is the probability that the node transmits times the probability that no other node transmits in t zero minus i and t zero in this interval. So if you go back, this is the interval. And also in this interval, no one sends, right? Because if anyone sends in these two intervals, then it will collide. So at the end, what you will get is 1 over 2e, so which is half of 1 over e. So it's 0 0.18. So it's only 18%. So this is very interesting. Now it shows that if we use pure aloha instead of slotted aloha, then the channel utilization drops uh, is this only half of the alloy it drops from 0 0.38 to 0 0.18 so it's worse than slotted aloha and actually this is not surprising because you, you see simpler uh, than uh, slotted aloha and uh, there is no concept of slot so it means that the the probability that they can collide is higher We are going to study CSMA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access. Uh, this is um, another random access, but this is uh, more structured and this is a more uh, popular um, technology at the moment. So the way it works is it first listens before it transmits. So uh, it, it first uh, listens to the channel to see if the channel is idle or not. If the channel is idle, then it transmits the entire frame. And if it senses the channel busy, then it defers the transmission. So it doesn't transmit the frame. So uh, this is similar to, uh, you know, 
when we are talking with someone else, we don't want to interrupt them, right? And uh, we, we, if, if, if someone wants to talk, we, 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 we listen. And if nobody is talking, then we, we, we start to talk. Okay, so the question is, if I just listen and if I find the channel idle and then I transmit, does it mean that I'm not going to have any collision uh, in my system? Now, interestingly, the answer is no. Um, and the reason is because of the propagation delay. I mean, there is a delay between uh, when you start to talk and the time that uh, someone else can listen to you. And this delay can still cause collision. So we can see that in this animation. So what you see here is um, one, two, three, four stations connected to this wire. And uh, let's say that at time t0, the second one, this one, starts to transmit. So this, it started transmitting, but you can see the signal at t1 has still not reached to the last one. So if this last station here wants to send a frame at T1, it senses the channel and it finds the channel still idle. So it starts to transmit this is the red signal. And these two signals collide here, but they still don't know it has collided. And then um, at this time, uh, the last station knows that, oh, someone else is transmitting because these two, he, he can listen to his signal. And at this, and at this time here, this station knows that this station is transmitting. So there is a lag. So this is a propagation delay. So the distance and the propagation delay, they play a role in determining collision probability. So you can see CSMA, which is listen before you talk, reduces the collision probability, but it doesn't eliminate collisions. It cannot completely eliminate collisions. So what's the biggest remaining problem uh, if we cannot eliminate the collisions? Okay, so the, the problem is the collisions still take full slot. Uh, so you can see that... Um, even if they collided, um, it, it was transmitted, the full frame was transmitted. And this host, the red one, started here and then it continued up to here. So the entire slot is used up despite the collisions happening. So the collisions is a problem. And that's why um, there is this collision detection technology. Uh, so collision detection uh, means that, of course, you, you still defer, um, just like CSMA, if the channel is busy. Uh, and if you find it idle, you go ahead and transmit. But uh, you, you have to detect the collisions. Now, the collisions are detected uh, within a very short time, like if you go back. You can see uh, at this point, uh, the last host, uh, it knows that th there is a collision because it's receiving the signal from this one as well. So the collision is detected pretty quick within this time, right? But it continued transmitting all the way up to here. So there's a lot of wastage. So if you can detect the collision within a very short time, then you can abort it as soon as possible right, uh, as soon as collision is detected. And that, that's how you can reduce the channel wastage, right? You don't have to continue transmitting. Now, in wired LANs, uh, it's, it's very easy to detect collision because you have two wires. One is for transmission and one is for reception. And they are separate wires. So while you are transmitting, you can also monitor your uh, re receiver uh, uh, line and if you are also receiving uh, when you are transmitting then it means there is a collision then you can abort your transmission but this is very difficult in wireless lands because especially when the um, same frequency is used by the uh, transmission and the reception 
uh, then the, 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 tr the transmitter signal overwhelms the receiver uh, because it's very close next to each other. So the receiver cannot uh, detect the signal from other stations uh, and as a result collision detection is very challenging in wireless LANs and this is something we're going to cover in week 10. Okay, so um, um, do we have any restriction on the minimum frame size and the maximum distance between um, any two hosts on the LAN? And, and, and if so, why? So you can see in this picture that between this time and this time, right, this is the collision and detect and abort time. So at, at this time, uh, this this host uh, detects that there is a collision and at this time this host detects that there is a collision so that the time it takes for them to detect uh, it depends on how far they are these two stations this one and this one if they are further apart then it would take them longer to detect because the propagation uh, delay would be larger so um, and also at this point uh, if the YOLO, this station, stopped transmitting its frame uh, before, uh, b b too, too early, uh, then it, it wouldn't, so, so let's look at this, this one. So if it started here, but if it finished the frame very quickly, then it wouldn't detect that its frame was collided because not, it's until this point that it knew that there was a collision. So it means that it has to continue transmitting for a while. It means there is a minimum frame size needed. So we can see also uh, that minimum frame size needed and a maximum distance uh, is, is needed. So we are going to um, see um, uh, that what sort of practices are there. So in Ethernet you can see the minimum frame size is 64 bytes. It means that uh, 46 bytes of data has to be there in the packet. I mean you can't have zero bytes. So if you have less than 46 bytes it has to be padded to make sure that you have 64 bytes. And later we are going to see why we need to be uh, have 64 bytes. And we are going to see that there is a relationship between the minimum packet size and the length of the local area network link that you can have in your LAN. So let's do uh, this exercise. You can see host 1 here and you can see host 2 here, right? So when host 1 is transmitting, uh, then this signal uh, is traveling and it takes propagation delay D because the signal has a speed, right? Um, this is very close to the speed of light. Um, it's the speed of electron, but it takes a, a non-zero uh, time to reach, and this is the propagation delay D. So just before host 2 receives it, if it senses the channel, then it will find the channel idle. So it will go ahead and proceed and it will transmit. Soon after transmitting, host 2 will know that there is a collision but for host 1, it has to wait for another another D. So you can see there is, uh, two D is needed uh, for reliably detecting the collision. So it's a round trip uh, propagation delay uh, between two hosts. So now you can see that why uh, if, if we have a minimum frame size, uh, then why that restricts the span of the network and this formula captures that so you will see if you work this out then you will see that the the maximum length of the LAN link that you can allow it actually depends on the minimum frame size and it also depends on the band with the speed of the transceiver uh, with this equation and propagation speed is 2 times 10 to power 8 meter per second for electrons on the um, on the wire and it says three times 10 to power 8 for in the space uh, for speed of light and wireless and if you do this calculation then for a 10 megabit per second ethernet where the bandwidth is 10 megabit per second so it's 10 to power 7 then you will find 
that it is um, uh, approximately um, about uh, five uh, five kilometers. Uh, so the, the maximum length of a 10 megabit per second Ethernet can be uh, five uh, kilometer. But this is actually much less for 10 gigabit per second than today's Ethernet and 100 megabit per second. So I leave you to uh, compute this um, for 10 megabit per second and 100 megabit per second to see what is the length. So it means that uh, if you are connecting to the Ethernet switch, that the switch cannot be too far uh, from your uh, station. So if you look at the CSMSCD collision detection algorithm, then you see that uh, these are the steps. So the network interface card receives a datagram, IP datagram from the network layer. It creates a frame and then it senses the channel. If the channel is idle, then you start transmitting the frame, right? You don't have to transmit the frame completely if there is a collision, which we are going to see later. But if it's busy, then you wait until the channel becomes idle and then you transmit, right? Now, if you are if you are successful in transmitting the frame completely without detecting another transmission, that is, without detecting collision, then you are done. Then it was successful, right? But if you detect another collision, what do you do? So if you detect another collision, there is no point of wasting the entire uh, slot. So you abort, right? So you abort the transmission immediately and you send a jamming signal so that uh, the other stations can still hear you and they can detect their uh, collision. So after aborting, there is this binary exponential backup. So the idea is that if you are aborting, it means you have detected a collision, then it means that the network uh, has a lot of stations they are trying to transmit. So in that case, if you just wait for uh, the channel to become idle, then everyone else would be waiting and then again they will transmit and again it will collide. So a smarter way to avoid collision in this case is to back off. And this is exponential back off. So it is the first collision, then it's 2 to the power 0. If it's the second time you are colliding, it's 2 to the power 1 and things like that. So, um, the, so if, if you are being unsuccessful and back-to-back -back, uh, detecting collisions, then you need to back off for a longer time. If back off means that even if the channel becomes idle, then you are not going to transmit because you are in back off. So this helps uh, to uh, you know, uh, avoid the collapse of the network. I think we are in a position to now um, check um, our understanding of CSMSCD against these four ideal criteria and we want to see which of these criteria are met by CSMSCD. So let's do one by one. So the first criteria, if only one node wants to transmit, can I transmit at the full rate? Um, the answer um, so the answer is yes, right? Because uh, yeah, there is no collision then. So you can continue to transmit back to back and you can have the full rate. But if there are multiple nodes, M nodes uh, want to transmit, then can each one of them get R over M? Okay, so this is a tricky question. So what happens if there are multiple nodes that there will be collisions, there will be back off? So uh, some of the bandwidth uh, will be wasted and the entire R bits per second cannot be achieved and as a result R over M is not true. How about 3? It is fully decentralized, that's great. Okay, so it's met and it's kind of simple, so 4 is also met. So we are now done with uh, CSMA and CSMA with the uh, collision detection uh, extension uh, for that. Um, so um, we will continue uh, and look at um, other kind of medium access control uh, control algorithms shortly.
Now we come to the uh, last group of uh, medium access control protocols uh, called taking turns. So taking turns will be, as we are going to see very soon, that uh, will be a bit different than channel partitioning and uh, random access MAC protocols. Um, so um, uh, in channel partitioning, uh, the, the advantage is that it can share the channel efficiently and fairly at high load uh, because uh, it has already been partitioned and everyone is guaranteed to have is piece of the channel but uh, at low load it's not very efficient uh, because it has already been partitioned into n pieces and even if the load is low you cannot get more than one over n in random access the the at low load uh, you can fully utilize but at high load you have collision overhead so we are going to see how taking turns protocols are different So in this picture, we are looking at a particular uh, taking turn approach, which is uh, based on polling. So at the right hand side in the picture, um, you can uh, see um, that we have one, two, three, four stations, but then we have a master. So these are called uh, slave stations, and they basically can only uh, talk to the master when the master pulls it. So we are going to see the animation. So you is pulling the first one and the first one sending the data. So the second, third and the fourth stations, they cannot send the data at that time. Now the master is now pulling the third one and the third one is sending the data. So you can see that the master has a total control and it has to pull and only then they can send. So we have polling overhead because you need a master and it has to send the polling data and there is some time uh, slot lost for polling and there is delay because until you are polled you cannot respond and there is this single point of failure. So if this master somehow fails then none of them can communicate. And this is another taking turn, but this is token. So one, two, three, four. So the token, this token is going around and you have to get hold of the token before you can send data. So here the token is going around in a ring and this host has nothing to send. So it's going to release the token. And this host has got some data to transmit. So now it's holding the token okay so no one else has the token so no one else can transmit data on the ring right so it is holding the token so it can send the data and once the data goes around and comes back here the data maybe was destined for this one or this one doesn't matter the data will come back to it and then it can release the token so here we can see using token passing we can control the transmission on the uh, on the link in this case is ring and we can avoid collision. So time has come to have a look at how these uh, taking turns protocols um, meeting the um, four uh, ideal requirements uh, for medium access. The first one, so let's go one by one. The first one is, are we getting, um, if there is only one node, is it getting the full rate R? Well, if both token and poll, if you are the only one, then you can always send. So yes, it does uh, meet the requirement. And if there are M nodes, now can they get um, R over M share? Um, the, for both of them, yes, they can, uh, because there is no collision and there is no loss. But uh, how about uh, is it um, uh, fully decentralized it's not decentralized as you can see there is a master for polling and um, so uh, this is not decentralized and is it simple uh, we have this uh, polling mechanism we have this token mechanism so we have something on top of the normal communication so this is not that simple so with that, we have actually finished uh, the MAC protocols. And if you look at them, uh, then we have three different kinds. Channel partitioning, this is done statically in the beginning. 
and you can use time or you can use a frequency domain to do uh, to chop up your um, channel but this is not very good when the network is not loaded much this is only good when the network is heavily loaded and that's why we have random access so most of the networks we keep the load low and random access performs very well the examples are aloha slotted aloha csma and the csma with the collision detection extension uh, csma cd is used in the ethernet uh, which is wired uh, but in wireless 802.11 which is the wireless version of ethernet we cannot use collision detection because this is difficult as we uh, explained uh, earlier so we use something else called collision avoidance. Uh, we are going to study uh, collision avoidance when we study wireless networks next week. And in taking turns, we can have polling or we can have token passing, right, from a central side. So Bluetooth uh, does polling, uh, FDDI and token ring does token passing. Um, so that uh, sums up uh, our uh, discussions about medium access control uh, protocols um, and in fact uh, this is the end of the um, uh, first part of the link layer uh, we are going to continue uh, link layer uh, um, in the second part which will be section 6.4 uh, from your text